Well, slightly less controversial than Lives That Matter is intravitreal injections for GA. And very similarly to Tom Hanks' character, I've got a lot to say about this, and I gave myself enough time. So Pegsita Coplan, Sifovri, and we also have another one called Iserve. Uh, why am I blanking on its name? Anybody help? Advanced Captad Pegol. It doesn't really flow off the tongue either. So I don't have as much data on that. Derby and Oaks two-year data. So this came out uh, last year. And my first concern was the safety data. This is from the prescribing information. So we basically had three groups. Uh, actually, we had four groups. We had a monthly group, we had an every other month group getting treatment, and the control groups were every month and every other month as well. Um, so, and we had a lot of patients, like 600 in each of these studies. So we have like, I, th I think, I might be missing it by a little bit, I think about 1,200 patients. So the monthly group had an incidence of wet AMD of 12%, okay? Every other month group is 7%, and the control group is 3%. So that's concerning, but not that concerning, because we're like, well, we got anti -bad Jeffs. Mm -hmm. So you just get another treatment. Some of these patients in this study did not, they weren't allowed to have wet AMD entering the study. But in, in clinical practice, if I have a wet AMD patient who also has GA, I have no problem giving them both, right? So oh, we're like, okay, it's all right. Don't love it, but inflammation was higher in the monthly group, 4% versus 2% in the every other month group <clears throat> versus less than 1% in the control group. This wasn't hemorrhagic occlusive retinal vasculitis, asterisk, asterisk, in the study. So it wasn't scary like brolicizumab, again, in the study. Uh, but still, you know, a little bit of atritis, a little bit of anterior uveitis, well, we can manage that. This one bothered me a lot. Ischemic optic neuropathy, and again, it's a small percentage, but it's basically 2% of the monthly group. This, for me, automatically ruled out doing it monthly. By the way, this is my own personal opinion. I'm obviously not employed by anybody saying, so say whatever I want. Uh, but there, there's going to be a, you may have some well-respected retina doctors here. I don't know any of your retina doctor's preferences. I mean, I knew what one of them was like six months ago. I don't know what it is now. And this is not intended to be disrespectful towards anyone. This is my own opinion. Happy to change it as facts change. So 0.2% on the ION or NAION, the every other month group, and 0% the control group. There were some post hoc analyses. Looked like people that had disc at risk were more likely to get NAION. No brain, that's a no-brainer. But they didn't really look at like what percentage of patients across the board had disc at risk to begin with. So we really had no pretest probability that much. Death. Nobody wants to talk about this, but it's like 7% of the monthly group, which is basically double, almost double what the other two groups are. So again, not, not going to do this monthly, but then if I have a patient every other month, should I tell them this is happening in the monthly? So I actually took a chart like this in a Word document, along with like 12 Q&A things, and basically handed out to all my patients that were considering it. And I said, listen, here are my concerns. It's been five or 10 minutes talking about it. Here's a handout. You don't have to remember anything I'm saying. Take this. I'm not, I, I, there's no way I'm giving you this shot until you talk to your loved ones about this. I have some concerns, but this is just half of my concerns. The other half was this. So the primary endpoint, this is all not in the BCSC, by the way. Primary endpoint was rate of GA progression. Okay, and, it, and the two studies, well, actually one of the meta, Oaks meta, not Derby. You know why there's two studies? FDA re requires it. They want two parallel, you know, randomized control trials, phase three. So, and interestingly, you know, one of them didn't even meet it. They, they had four secondary endpoints, difference in reading speed. Actually, I didn't even list them all here. One was, and one was called the functional reading index, something like that, FRI. Re maximum reading speed, best corrective visual acuity, and then a threshold microperimetry test. Do you know what a microperimetry test is? It's fine if you don't. Um, so uh, visual field testing is like a threshold perimetry. Microperimetry is basically like we, we project up a picture of the fundus, and then we also will say we want to test this point exactly. And so we'll shine a light where we think maybe there's RPE atrophy and say, do you see it, don't you see it? So think of it like regular... Humphrey visual field, but now we could see exactly which part of the fovea is being tested. It has like an overlay of their fundus map. And we can get, they call it micro because when we can pick these little tiny areas. So basically we looked at vision in normal illumination. Uh, the other group, the gather studies for uh, Avanza Captep Pegol, uh, they, they actually had low luminance, best corrective visual acuity. But anyway, they did, nobody met their functional endpoints, meaning 
vision, reading, reading max speed, and then this threshold, this threshold microperimetry, there was no difference whether you got the shot or didn't get the shot at the end of the two years. So I have a problem with that because when I tell a patient I'm going to give them something, I'm not expecting improvement. Everybody knows we're not going to improve anything, right? The only goal is to freeze it in time or to slow it down so it doesn't get worse. You're driving now, we want you to still be driving in two or three years. So we all get the concept. We're not improving anything, but, there's, but we are trying to provide a benefit, right? We're trying to keep, slow it down. That is a benefit. It's not improvement. So after two years of sham groups were allowed to receive sifovary, what does that mean? That means that we'll never have functional inf information on functional data for differences. We're not going to have three-year data. We're not going to have four-year data. In other words, my question to one of the reps, you know, the hired guns that they send out, a retina doctor that came to speak to us in San Antonio was like, so we know at two years there's no difference. There's no benefit. How many years does this, do the patients have to be getting these shots every month before there actually is a benefit? Is it three years? Is it 20 years? Will they live long enough to actually achieve a quote-unquote benefit? So those are my problems, and I basically scared most of my patients away, which is totally fine with me. Then uh, there's H all this HORV data. Have you guys heard about that? So they, they've had several cases, I don't remember how many, of hemorrhagic occlusive retinal vasculitis or other variations of retinal vasculitis or occlusion. And, and not exactly like brutalism, certainly not as frequent. And in my mind, that was not a big game changer. I already quote to people, hey, if you get in ophthalmitis, you could lose your eye. It's NLP. So that kind of put, for, in my mind, I put that in ophthalmitis. Now, the truth is, in ophthalmitis post-injections, it may not be that severe. I've certainly had NLP patients. But if you look at the data, I'll, most people get like reading or close to reading vision back if they were that, that way at baseline. But for some reason, those HORV cases scared a lot of retina doctors. But then this paper came out. And if you guys have not read Rick Spade, if you're interested in retina, Rick Spade writes some of the best papers. They've been the most, in my mind, influential. Uh, these are not randomized clinical trials. These are like his deep thinking about the retina. He's the one that basically is the reason, he's the reason why we call it the ellipsoid zone and not the ISOS. So because of a paper, because of diagramming. So he wrote this really interesting paper, and you could tell from this picture that it's going to be interesting. So basically, he's like, here's our simplistic interpretation of an F. AF, fundus autofluorescence, which by the way, we never got to that lecture. Someday we will do it. So we've got the happy RPE cell down below the optic nerve. He's got his arms up, you know, he's lifting weights. That's kind of that normal fluorescence pattern, right? And then he's pointing for the other one into that uh, inferior temporal area of the GA, and that's an RPE cell that's died and gone to heaven, right? And basically that we know because it's black, it's no longer there. So his thought is, well, you know, so we know, here, I'll just read through it. This is straight from his paper. So if we look at the histology of RPE atrophy in this area at the edge of it, we call it the junctional region, these RPE cells are sick. They're not working that well. And he says that they may even start to secrete abnormal hormones. We should go back to that in a moment. These cells, which are alive in the sense that they maintain metabolic processes and contain pigment and lipofusion, and therefore are autofluorescent, but they're still not effective in their function. Okay, next point. The immune system, of which the complement system is an important part, maintains retinal homeostasis by clearing these cells. So if we, hey Taylor, if we interrupt the complement system here, are we taking away our ability to clear out zombie or half-dead cells? And his hypothesis is that when we're disrupting complement, which is what I didn't even tell you, these these two treatments are C3, C5 inhibitors. We might be just leaving, allowing zombie cells to stay there. So inhibiting the complement system, as he wrote, may reduce the ability to clear these cells, resulting in less loss of autofluorescence over time without functional benefits to the patient. In other words, the, the autofluorescence would look better, but it wouldn't necessarily be functionally better. And again, these two drugs were, their approval is predicated on the idea that FAF or that, that these zones of RPE atrophy not getting larger as fast was someday going to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. But what if we're actually just leaving half-dead cells there that do nothing? These cells also, we, we do know that RPE cells secrete VEGF, and it might be that the sicker they are, the more VEGF they secrete, and that might explain why we have a higher rate of macular neovascularization in these patients getting these shots. 12%, like quadruple. So... That's what I'm going to leave you with. If, there, if you have an attending that loves doing these shots, 
I would just say ask him or her about it and what their what their thought process is on it. Uh, I doubt you do have somebody who loves these shots. I personally think, well, here's my one question I'm going to leave you with, and this tells you what I think. Are Sifovri and Iserve the emperor's new clothes? So I think, think you know, because of the HORV cases, we've all the retina doctors for the most part have pulled back from doing these shots. But prior to that, I mean, they were being used quite a bit. Um, I was obviously using the trepidation. I'm not saying this in any self-congratulatory way. We need a treatment for this disease. It's a very bad disease. I have a lot of patients that are desperate. It's a very sad conversation to have with somebody when they think that their wet AMD is being treated perfectly well, but then they're still losing vision. And that's inevitably what happens. Um, so sorry to leave you on a downer, but I think it's important to ask these questions, to think about these things while you're still young and are impressionable and are still, you know, as you get older, you kind of stop sometimes thinking deeply about things. Rick Spade is the exception to that rule. So thanks for your attention. HSM plus, and here's my references. I think that's it. Any questions? I finished on time for once. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. My pleasure.